and uh, you're in it for a treat today. Um, I met Sandra back in 1997. It's been a little while now. And uh, I was at my dad's church, and she came to our church the first week, and I was on staff there, and I said, well, she's kind of cute. And I asked my friend, I said, listen. And so you got to be careful. When you're a pastor in church, you don't be dating the flock. You don't do that. You know, that's, that's malpractice, right? So we don't do that. But we became dear friends, my best friend. She used to eat, I used to, she used to, I used to eat her desserts, and I'm a germaphobe. And she used to hold my wallet. And that's still going on today. And so uh, we've been married now since 2000, and she has been an amazing, strong support for me. Uh, she, uh, she originally came from Bogota, Colombia, and she has a heart for God. She has a heart for for myself. She has a heart for you. And, and the heart for our children. It's the book of Proverbs talks about the wonder of a mother with their child. And I have just watched her through the years and how she's just marvelously been a mother to my, to the children that God has entrusted to Luke who just turned 18 yesterday. Hard to believe. Yeah, it's crazy, right? Hannah is going to be 16, and then Matthew, who is 11. And what a blessing it has been to see her be a mother to these children and have such a passion and love that just reflects the heart of God. And so I am so delighted and so blessed today to have my wife, Sandra Bucci, to share the word of God this morning. Would you please do me a big favor and welcome my wife and the mother of our children, Hello? Yep? Okay. Good. Hopefully I don't have to take my earrings because the first service I had to, but if it start making a lot of noise, I'm just going to get rid of it. So anyways, good morning, everyone. Look at all of you. What a beautiful faces. Um, yeah. <laughs> so what an honor it is to be here today with all of you, and I'm very humble and I'm very grateful to my sweet and wonderful husband, uh, Pastor Eric. Thank you for giving me the privilege to be here today. And aren't we all blessed to have such an amazing pastor? Yes, we are definitely blessed. No, it's not working? Huh? Take the earring? Okay. Okay, no problem. Just one. The new style now. <laughs> anyway, so as I was saying, um, he's a wonderful man of God. And um, honey, I just want to honor you today for being the spiritual authority here in this house, here in Cornerstone. I love you. I thank God because I have seen you walk with the Lord. You're a man of integrity. Uh, you love the Lord and you seek him daily. What you preach here is what you practice. So thank you. I love you. And I also, I also want to tell my kids, who are probably not here yet, I think they're coming in the third service, um, Luke, Hannah, and Matthew, how much I love them and how amazing it is to be their mom. And they truly are gifts from God to my life. And I cannot even talk about them too much, especially Luke, because he's the one leaving soon, and I get very emotional. Just want to let you know that it's been very hard to know that he's going to graduate and he's going to be going. So I'm not going to start talking because I'm going to start crying. <laughs> so anyways, I know that we already have prayed for all the moms. Um, but I just want to say to my mom today, who is at home and had surgery two days ago, um, Mom, thank you for everything that you have done, everything that you still continue to do. You are a loving and very prayerful woman of God, and I love you so much, Mom. And also to my beautiful as well mother in love, who is also in New Jersey. Mom, thank you for raising up such an amazing godly son and a godly family. And I love you and appreciate you as well. Uh, well, with that being said, um, I also um, want to, before I start with the message, um, I just wanted to encourage all the moms and the spiritual moms this morning. Um, it's just a very quick word of encouragement. I know that it has been very difficult uh, the past couple of years. Um, 
And I just want to let you know that the enemy and his job is to kill you, to annihilate you, to destroy you. But moms, today I want to let you know something. I want you to listen. I want you to not give up. I don't want you to give up because you are not a quitter. You are a warrior. And I want you to say, and I want to say today that you need to stand up in prayer for your families, for your children, for your spouses. God has great plans for your lives and the lives of your families. Do not believe, moms, and accept any of the lies of the enemy. He is an expert of whispering to us, moms. Listen, he continually tells us, oh, look at you. Look what you did in the past. You have messed up big time. You are not a great example to your kids. Look how you, what you just did to them. You don't have anything to offer to your children. You are not enough. And I want to say today that that's not how God sees you. Moms, 1 Peter 5 to 8 to 9 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion seeking who he might devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by the brotherhood in the world. The devil, moms, is your adversary. He is your enemy. When you are in the battlefield, do you just stand up there and allow the enemy to defeat you and attack you? No way. I wanted to encourage you. What did you do then? What did you do? You fight back. Amen. And how do you do that? I tell you what I do. I love to look at my family picture. If you need to get a family picture, cage yourself a family picture and pray over your family. Do not give up. I'm telling you. You continually pray. Believe me, when you are by yourself, that's your battlefield. You girl, get your sword of the spirit and you fight back. You have authority, the authority of the Lord. I had enough of us feeling defeated. We are not defeated. Jesus Christ gave us the victory already. You stand up strong. Do not mess up with us, girls. That's correct? We belong to the Lord. We have power in him. You wear the full armor of God. You will resist the devil. And you will fight like a warrior with those weapons that the Lord Almighty has given us. Amen. Okay, Amen. can you tell I'm from Colombia? Come on. <laughs> Sorry. All right, let's pray. Father, I thank you so much, Lord, for today, Lord. I, I thank you, Lord, for the fun, the wonderful times, Lord. But I thank you, Lord, that... Most important, Lord, right now in this place is you, Lord. And right now, Father, our attention, Lord, goes all to you. I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you will remove any hindrance, any distraction, Lord. I submit myself to you, Lord. Father, this humble and broken vessel, Lord, is just here to convey your word, Lord. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you, you, you will use me. That your words, Lord, will penetrate deep in the hearts. That you will open the spiritual ears, Lord. And that your heart, Lord, your heart for the church will be shared, Lord. We love you, Lord. And we welcome you in this place. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So today I want to talk about a dream that my daughter Hannah uh, had about eight years ago. Uh, this is a dream that I have kept in my heart. Um, and back then when she shared it with uh, my husband and I, I, I thought, wow, this is a really nice dream. But I didn't think too much of it. I thought it was very powerful. I made sure we wrote it down. Um, and, uh, and, I, and my daughter, for some reason, remembered that dream very, very vividly. So 
I don't know about you, but I love to take God's word very seriously. And I just don't believe just a little part of it. I believe all of it. In Acts 2, 17, it tells us that in the last day, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people, your sons and daughters. Could be little kids, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. So the Lord indeed speaks to our children. I want to encourage you to listen to them when they say, when they share their dreams, when they have an impression, when they feel like the Lord is speaking to them, and then write down what they're saying, and then pray about it, and maybe go back to it. It's important that we listen to our children because as the word says, he's speaking to them. So in her dream, my daughter saw this big-sized gold anchor that was placed somewhere in this property here in Cornerstone in 1146 Waterbury Road. She also, besides the anchor, she saw a big boat, and she said that the boat used to belong, there was an ancient boat, and that used to belong to the apostles. So years later, to today, I can tell you that that dream has a very important meaning, and I believe is very much relatable to what I'm going to be sharing today with all of you. Hannah's dream, I feel, is of a great significance because I really believe that the boat that she saw is the church in general. It's not just the building. It's me, as you, and all of the believers the waters that she saw as well where the boat was located is the culture, is the world we live on. And the anchor that she saw, that gold anchor, was the most important symbol in this dream because it's, the, it's our hope and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today, as you can see, as you can see and hear, we're gonna be talking a lot about. A lot of nautical words. So how many of you like the beach, the lakes, the sun, sunbathing, uh, swimming in the water? I'm sure all of us love that. And I'm sure many of you here also have boats that you are almost getting ready to take them out for the season, right? Well, my family, we don't own any boats. We own boogie boards. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, my husband, um, he's so cute. I love him. <laughs> he loves adventure. In our honeymoon, I just wanted to be at the beach. He wanted to go ride jet skis, this and the other. But he just loves like riding boogie boards, canoes, kayaks, jet skis, bows, anything that flows. He loves it. So one time we were at the beach at Avon by the Sea in New Jersey. We love that beach. Uh, and, and this was before Pastor was diagnosed with melanoma. Before that, he will enjoy hours in the water and the sun. Uh, so now we cannot do that. And if he goes in the sun, he looks like a Victorian doll. I make sure I cover him very well. Not show any skin. So every, he walks by and everybody's like, ooh. <laughs> anyway, so one particular time, he was in the water resting on his boogie board. And he just like chills. Like he loves the water. So I was in the sand with the kids. This was quite a few years ago when they were little. And I saw him. I'm like, oh, okay, he's not going too far. But I, I was like paying attention. And I was like there when playing with the kids when all of a sudden I hear the whistle from the lifeguard. And then I'm like, oh, who was, who's that that they're like trying to get attention? It was my husband. He was far, far away. So the lifeguard was like whistling and like telling him to come back. And he was like, oh, okay, no big deal. Meanwhile, I was like, honey, come back to us, please. <laughs> so it took him some time, but he made it safe to the shore. The currents had taken him away so, so far away. So there is no doubt that the water currents in the ocean are powerful. And without even realizing it, one can drift away very easily. And let me tell you today, 
that the danger of drifting away is not just limited to the physical realm. I want you to read with me right now in Hebrews 2.1. If you have your Bibles, take it out or open your app. Hebrews 2.1 says, we must pay, we must, listen to this word, must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. The author of Hebrews, which is unknown, we don't know, people think that is the Apostle Paul, is talking to Jewish believers who were going the, who, the, who were undergoing a lot of trials, a lot of persecution. Uh, they were in prison as well, simply because they were followers of Jesus. And many of those Jewish believers were drifting away. They were abandoning their faith. And just because they were followers of Jesus. The author here in the book of Hebrews wants to challenge them to remain faithful to Jesus. So today's scripture, church, is a warning for all of us, all of us. It is the warning to be aware of the danger of drifting away from the Lord. And I'm saying all of us because my husband, even in being a pastor, he can also has to be careful to be uh, drifting away. Same with me. None of us are exempt. I believe my daughter's dream is a prophetic dream and a word from the Lord in such a time like this for all of us to be secure. Again, secure and anchor in Jesus and in his word. Here in verse 1, chapter 2, the Greek word that says, pay much closer attention. I, you want me to pronounce it? I'm going to try. It's a very beautiful Greek word. So it says, polygenat literi prosoji. How did I do, Greek people here? <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, that Greek word, polynegal literi prosoji, is a word that is like that, that symbolizes like when the lifeguard was calling my husband. Hey, come back. Be careful. Pay much attention. You're going too far. It's like when a mom is telling a child that's going to be crossing the street. Be careful. You must pay closer attention. So that word is like, it's like what the, Spirit, the Holy Spirit is saying today to all of us. Just don't just pay attention. It says pay much closer attention lest you drift. And that word, we must it's not just a suggestion. It's not a hint. It is a demand. Play, pay much closer attention to Jesus Christ. God's word says in Proverbs 4, 20 to 22. My son and daughter, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them. And are healing to all their flesh. So you know drifting always lead us away from God. There are not Christians that have ever drifted closer to God. It's always far and further away from him. And deeper into the things of our fallen world. I know these past three to five years have been very, very difficult. And we have faced so many cultural change and things are shifting and changing very very rapidly more than in the last 40 years that I could remember we're living in times in like, like the book of Hebrews where being a believer is getting hotter and hotter for those Jewish believers in the book of Hebrews it was very very difficult for them to follow Jesus they were being ostracized by Jewish people they were no longer allowed to be part of that community. And that created so much difficulty. They thought that if, they, they, if they could just give up Jesus, that the families will be back to them. And that they perhaps could have a better standing in the society. And that's why this author 
and Hebrews emphasized Christ as being the supreme. He encouraged them to keep their eyes on Jesus. So when they turn away from Jesus, that they will know that there is no life in that. These people were battling real life stuff, just like all of us today. And they were trying to find their way through it. And as the currents of this world are shifting and are changing so rapidly, it makes me wonder how secure are the links that are connecting us, all of us, to our anchor, Jesus Christ. The currents are going to continue to shift. Things are going to continue to get harder and difficult. I'm telling you that. Those are I'm sorry to share this news, but that's what's going to be happening. So I want to ask you, how are those chains? Are they holding strong? Because let me tell you, if they're not, and if you're not anchored in Jesus strongly, your boat will tip over. Now, do you remember that I mentioned about this big gold anchor? Well, I love how... The book of Hebrews continue with this nautical theme. Let's read together from the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, 19 to 20. And it says, listen, church, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind, behind the curtain where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So I want to talk today uh, more about anchors and what is the significance of the anchors. So for many centuries, the anchors um, have always been a symbol of hope. This symbol was especially significant uh, to the early persecuted church. Um, there is a cemetery in Italy called Priscilla Cemetery. It's in the catacombs in Rome. And uh, there they discover uh, a bunch of symbols that had the, the, the anchor. Um, these Christians that were buried there were Christians that held all of their meetings in hiding. They were being persecuted. They were threatened with death because of their faith. These committed Christians used the anchor to guide the way to their secret meetings. The anchor appears 70% of the time in this um, cemetery. The anchor is the dominant symbol. And it was for the Christian the symbol of their hope in Christ and his divine promises. So you, all of you who own a boat, do you know that the boat provides the stability, the safety, and calm and dangerous waters by holding the ship secure in just one place. When there are storms, when the waters are rough, when the wind blows so hard and the rains are very torrential, the anchor prevents the ship from being tossed and turned. And in calm waters, the anchor keeps the ship from drifting. How very similar is our hope in Christ when the world's temptations, trials, and tribulations rock our boat, our stability is going to be anchored in Christ. And it's without tossing, turning, or drifting. Christ, our Lord, provides the real safety and the security that gives us peace and hope. So today I want to do something different. And Please don't be upset with me. It's more like a reversal psychology. <laughs> so today I want to give you bad advice. So bear with me. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay, honey. Just calm down. <laughs> Fine. So anyways, I'm going to give you bad advice about how you can drift away from God. I know it sounds horrible. Just me. Okay, first, neglect your time with God. Yeah. You want to drift far and far away from God? Let's read Psalm 63, what it says. You, God, are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. And today, my bad advice is that if you want to drift away from God and not be angering God, 
Don't spend time with God. Go ahead. Yeah, no, don't spend time with God. And when you go to church, don't pay attention what the pastor is speaking. How about you being in your phone? Ooh, send some selfies. What about during worship? Be distracted with the lies, with everything that is around. And just come only once a month, once a month. Yep. And don't use your gifts and your talents. And completely, completely ignore God. That's my first bad advice. Yep. And the second is, yes, hang out with bad people. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good morals or character. Yep, so go ahead, hang around to those, with those bad friends so you don't have to share your faith with Jesus. And don't hang out with the faithful ones because they might pray for you. They might encourage you in your faith. Also, you can go ahead and marry an unbeliever and be an equally Joe and if you really want to drift away from the Lord. Number three, another bad advice. If you want to drift far, far away from the Lord, give in to temptation. James 1, 14 to 15 says, But each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. So my advice, never resist temptation because his sin is fun. We will have a spiritual death, no joys, no peace, no faith. Tell yourself, oh, well, this is just the way I am. I can just continue seeing. All I have to do is release it to God, and he will forgive me. So why not hide your sin and also rationalize it? Number four, my other piece of bad advice, and for you to continue to drift more away from God. How about you love more the things of this world than you love God? 1 John 2.15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Hey, your world is your home. Why not get more material things? Fill your life with more distractions, more hobbies, more business in this world. So you stop being connected with God. Also, Love your social media. Oh, yeah. Make sure you pay attention to all the likes you get instead of how much God loves you and likes you. The number three, I'm number five, I'm sorry. And if everything else fails, just fake it. (laughs) Isaiah 29, 13 says, These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. The worship of me is based on merely human rules that they have been taught. You don't have to be extremely immoral so you can just fake Christianity. You can come to church and you can lift up your hands. How about getting a wonderful Christian bumper sticker? You can learn all the wonderful Christian language as well. And come to church on Sunday and greet everyone and impress everyone, especially after having a big fight in the car with your family that truly will make you drift away from God okay enough that's horrible bad advice I'm sorry no don't do any of that follow God's word and what that said I'm sorry I I hope I made a point to not today I hope you it was effective (laughs) and I humbly I want to say that I share that because I have experienced a few of them myself. And if you are honest, I'm sure you also had experienced some of them. I'm going to tell you that in my first few years as a pastor, pastor's wife, I always thought that I had to act a certain way, had to do certain things, and that I had to wear certain clothing and have a perfect family and children all well behaved. Oh my gosh, far from the truth. Far, far from the truth. Just like everyone else. Everyone in the Bucci family need Jesus. And we also need to be anchored in him. Amen. Amen. And yeah. <laughs> to be honest, I really was playing a role. More than I was leaving and pursuing my Lord. I was not anchored in the Lord. My role was 
being a full-time mom, a full-time wife, and a full-time pastor's wife. And sadly, a part-time follower of Jesus. And what about you today? Are you a full-time parent and a part-time follower of Jesus? Are you a full-time professional and a part-time follower of Jesus? Are you a full-time student and a part-time follower of Jesus? Are you a full-time business owner and a part-time follower of Jesus? And the list goes on and on and on. What are you? Revelations 3, 1 says, To the angel of the church in Sardis, write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. If you look at it, there was a time in your life that you were closer to Jesus than what you are right now. So what has happened? I'm here to tell you that Jesus didn't move. He didn't change. He is our anchor and he is unmovable. Hebrews 13a 13a says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Amen. Psalm 55, 19 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father, Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. So guess what? We are the ones that little by little drift away. However, this morning, I have very good news for all of you. I love this quote from Charles Stanley that says, we never drift so far that we are beyond God's ability to restore us. How beautiful and wonderful is the grace of God, everybody. Amen. Yes, Lord. So what do we do when we drift away? How do we get anchor back in the Lord. First of all, you need to acknowledge that you have been drifting. And so how do you know that you're drifting? I mean, these are just a little common signs that I'm going to give you, and it's the following. You have, you have been having a little desire to study God's word and pray. A diminishing desire also to be with God's people. A diminishing desire as well to share about Jesus. And also an increasing thrill over the things of this world. So what do we do? So what do we need to do? I want you to read with me in Revelations 2, 4 to 5. Yet I hold these against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. So church, the word of God is telling us that we need to repent and do the things you did at first. I want you to repeat with me right now. Say it. Repent and do the things you did at first. Repent and do the things you did at first. And what does repent mean? Repent simply means if you're going that direction, you are going to return and go back to God. You're going to change direction and go and return to God. So what are some of the things also that we did first when we met the Lord? Weren't we, weren't we all more passionate about God's word, about praying about sharing our faith with everybody and going to church was not an option i know that being in church doesn't make you a christian but it's important it's something that we emphasize here because we build each other up we build and also we keep each other accountable that's what we emphasize that's what we have small groups that's what we do all the things that we do on when one one the first wednesday that's what we have all these different little things that we do during the week and during the month so we are together and we encourage each other in the lord 
So going to church was not an option. It was not an option. It was where you belong, where you use your gifts, your talent. It was not a religious duty or a place that you have to go or I have to go. And let me tell you one thing that I learned in Colombia. And this might bother some of you, but I love that pastor, missionary pastor that founded my church in Colombia where I became a believer. One thing I remember is that he emphasized you bring your children to church. They live under your roof. You have no choice. You bring them to church. You don't give them an option. That's what he says. And it always stuck to my mind. And believe me, there are times when my kids fight me to go to church. Don't care. You get up, you get dressed, you go. Not an option. You get up and you come and worship the Lord. Sorry, just got up. Let it. I don't know what, who was that for, but just receive it with grace and love. I know. So anyways, um, so for closing, I wanted to ask you something. How are the chains that are connecting you to the anchor, Jesus Christ? Are they rusty? Are they damaged? Are they strong enough to hold you? Remember what we read in Hebrews 2.1. We must not an option. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to, we, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. And I'm emphasizing that because my husband and I, in this past two years, we have seen a lot of people that have drifted away. Sadly, it breaks our hearts. It's so sad. It's, it's, it's unbearable. And that's why I'm sharing this word with you. I feel like this is the time to do it because it's not going to be easy the next years that are coming. Let's not get stuck into the narrative of the Western culture here in America. Well, let's just go with the flow and drift and drift away from the foundations of our faith. I want to encourage you not to neglect prayer. Not to neglect fasting. Not to neglect to, be, to neglect to be here in the house of God. Not to neglect to be in the word of God. Do not neglect these basic spiritual disciplines. Lest you also drift away from so greater salvation. You know, God saved me. In 1993, saved these lost, insecure, fearful girl back in Bogota, Colombia, and gave me forgiveness for my past, gave me a brand new start and a hope for the future. That Jesus that I encounter still holds today in a world that is right now ravaged by war, by economic, political, and social instability. You might wake up every day and you must, must, might wonder what's next. What's going to happen next? And I want to tell you that you can walk in the future with confidence when you place your hope and your trust in the only true anchor, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You know why? Because he is the only one that is going to be able to hold you. He is the only one, nothing else. So let's pray right now. Oh, Lord. We just pray right now that you anchor us, Lord, back to you. Father, we live in this ever-shifting world. And we do not want to continue drifting away, Lord. Save us, Lord, from wasting our lives by giving our attention to what ignores you and to what dishonors you, Lord. If we're drifting, Lord... Capture us, Lord. We cannot do it in our own power because the currents are so strong, Lord. Lord, satisfy us today that we might live today in your joy. We need you, Lord. And especially, Lord, in this media age, Lord. Capture our hearts. Capture our eyes, Lord. Capture our ears, don't let us drift, Lord. We pray in the name of our steady 
anchor Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.